The Book of Isaiah, Part 7. In our last lecture, we had covered the um, oracles or the burdens of the lands surrounding Jerusalem from Moab to Syria to Edom, Adumiatima, to um, around to the Arabian side, Kedar and Arabia. Basically, the land surrounding Jerusalem and Judah and Israel, quite frankly. The lands that had troubled Israel, the lands that had troubled Judah. And they are a type of what is written um, in our Father's Word concerning the fact that Jerusalem would be compassed by her enemies in the last days. And uh, so far there have been about seven burdens. And uh, these burdens will concern the people round about Jerusalem, which um, are symbolic of the seven continents of the world in uh, the spiritual sense. In other words, they are meaning the seven continents, the one world government. Again, by spiritual connotation. Uh, when you're reading this book of Isaiah, as well as many others in the Bible, you have to look at both the historical and the prophetical for our time. And that's one of the wonderful things about our Father's living word is that it speaks to us in that way. It tells us both prophetical things that would happen in back in the time of Isaiah that he prophesied were going to happen concerning their time. And it also looks forward to our time and tells us of things that are going to happen in our time. So, as I said, there have been seven burdens or so. And uh, much like the seven churches that were in Asia, they are symbolic. Not just of those seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, but the seven churches that would be in the world. The seven types of churches, that is to say. So, we're going to continue with another burden, another oracle of God, and this will be towards Jerusalem. So we're going to begin with Isaiah chapter 22 and verse 1. And before we do, let us go to our Father in prayer and ask for guidance and wisdom as we study this, His Holy Word. Glorious Heavenly Father and King of the Universe, we come before your throne this day, Father, and we ask you to open our eyes and ears to the truth. We ask you to reveal to us, Father, through revelation, through type and example, through connotation, through prophecy, or through literal, the meanings of these things written in your word so that we may better understand your overall plan. And we ask, Father, that your hands always be upon these studies and that you open the eyes and ears of all who study with us that they too may receive truth and understanding from the study of your word in depth. And we ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the true and only Messiah, Yahshua. Amen. So, Isaiah chapter 22 and verse 1. <clears throat> the burden, which is to say the oracle of the Valley of Vision, which is concerning Jerusalem. That is the Valley of Vision. And that will be made clear as we proceed. What aileth thee now? That thou are wholly gone up to the housetops. Uh, why do people go up to the housetops? Because they're watchmen. They're watching for the enemy coming. In other words, they know the king of Babylon is coming against them, so they're watching and preparing. Verse 2. Thou art full of stirs, which means crying outs, a tumultuous city, joyous city. Thy slain men are not slain with the sword. Nor, with, or, nor dead in battle. In other words, they're not slain because they were slain with the sword in war or in battle. Uh, quite frankly, they're slain with the famine because these people are not turning to God. Verse 3. All thy rulers have fled together. They are bound by archers. All that are bound in thee are bound together which have fled from far. In other words, they got out of Dodge. Verse 4. Therefore I said, look away from me. I will weep bitterly. Labor not to comfort me. In other words, don't try to comfort me. Because of the spoiling of the daughter of my people. And of course, this utterance or this uh, burden is against Judah. 
during the time of the king of the Babylon. The Israelites have naturally gone into the captivity of Samaria beforehand. Verse 5. For it is a day of trouble, and of treading down, and of perplexity by the Lord God of hosts in the valley of vision. Again, Jerusalem. Breaking down of walls and crying of, to the mountains. In other words, they're weeping and lamenting. Verse 6. And Elam bare the quiver with the chariots of men and the horsemen. And Kir uncovered the shield. In other words, the enemy is coming from north and south. In other words, they're being encompassed. Uh, Kir and Elam represent the north and the south. Kir was a stronghold and so was Elam on the north and south side. Verse 7. And it shall come to pass that thy choicest valleys be full of chariots, and that the horsemen shall set themselves in array at the gate. And uh, in other words, they're going to be grossly outnumbered by the Babylonians, which are going to take them into captivity. But what are the four horsemen of the book of Revelation? There are, of key, there are of course, uh, death, war, famine, and pestilence. And uh, it's interesting that the word horseman is used here, set in array, because this also concerns our time at the coming of the Antichrist, verse 8. And he discovered the covering of Judah, and thou didst look in that day to the armor of the house of the forest. In other words, uh, to hide in the forest. In other words, the, the, the armor, the covering, uh, they looked for in the forest. In other words, they did not look for God to be their covering. They looked for the forest to hide them. Verse 9. Ye have seen also the breaches of the city of David, that they are many. In other words, there's many holes in the wall, many places for the enemy to get in. And this, of course, would be because God isn't blessing them. They had turned away from God. And ye gathered together waters of the lower pool. Uh, this would be cisterns. These cisterns mean that um, they have prepared themselves with water. In other words, they've, they've filled cisterns for battle. They have filled their, uh, the, the lower pool, the lower pool, of course, uh, symbolic of a cistern. They filled it up so that they would have water in the time of battle. Verse 10. And ye have numbered the houses of Jerusalem... And the houses ye have broken down to fortify the wall. In other words, they've taken the bricks and the uh, stones from the houses of Jerusalem to fortify the wall against the enemy. Only what they forgot to do was to include God in the equation. In other words, they've, they've taken time to prepare here. They've, they've made cisterns. They've no doubt stocked up with food and things that they would need as best they could. And they have fortified the walls of Jerusalem. But did they ask counsel of our Father? No. Verse 11. He have made also a ditch between the walls for the water of the old pool, but ye have not looked in unto the maker thereof. Neither had respect unto him that fashioned it long ago. Uh, who was it that fashioned it long ago? Well, David built Jerusalem, didn't he? Well, in a sense, yes, but we're talking about God here. In other words, they have fortified themselves against the enemy, but they have not used God as their shield. In other words, bricks and weapons and water and even food are not going to stop the Antichrist. And they're not going to stop the king of Babylon of that time, of which the Antichrist is symbolic of. Verse 12. And in that day, the Lord of God, the Lord God of hosts, called to weeping and to mourning and to baldness and to girdling with sackcloth. In other words, uh, to repentance. He calls them to repentance for what they've done. Baldness here, again, symbolic of being without the veil. What is it that God wants from us? 
He wants our unrequited love, our unconditional love. Hosea chapter 6 verse 6. That's what God wants. He wants our love. So in that day, God has called them to weeping and mourning and baldness and to girding with sackcloth. In other words, girding with sackcloth and uh, was a sign of mourning, a sign of lamentation. Verse 13. But this is what they did rather than repenting. And behold, joy and gladness slaying oxen and killing sheep and eating flesh and drinking wine. In other words, they're celebrating. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. In other words, let us uh, have our consolation now, because tomorrow we could die. Verse 14. And it was revealed in my ears by the Lord of hosts, in other words, into Isaiah's ears, Surely the iniquity shall not be purged from you till ye die. Thus saith the Lord of hosts. And that's against Judah, against Jerusalem. Verse 15. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Go and get thee unto the treasure, unto this treasurer, in other words, the money holder, even unto Shebna. Uh, the word Shebna means vigor. He vigorously holds the money, and of course this is the trademark of the Kenite, of which the Shebna was a Kenite, no doubt, which is over the house, and say, verse 16, What hast thou here? In other words, in Jerusalem. And whom hast thou here? In Jerusalem. That thou hast hewed thee out a sepulcher here, in Jerusalem. He that heweth him out a sepulchre on high. In other words, uh, a rich man's sepulchre. Up on a high place. And that graveth an habitation for himself in a rock. Where is it that the Kenites made their nest? In the clefts of the rock. That is to say, their rock. Uh, call to mind the words of Deuteronomy 32. Their rock, not our rock, the false rock. Uh, Numbers 24:21. What did what was the parable given by Moses towards the Kenite? And he looked on the Kenites and took up his parable and said, "Strong is thy dwelling place; thou hast put thy nest." In a rock. Again, a false rock. The false rock. The false Christ. And of course, the, the, the word itself, uh, Cain, means nest. Verse 17. Behold, the Lord will carry thee away with a mighty captivity. This is referring to Shebna. And Shebna here is a person, but he's symbolic of the Kenite. He's symbolic of all the Kenites. Behold, the Lord, will, the Lord will carry thee away in a mighty captivity, and will surely cover thee, that is to say, bury him. In other words, a common man's burial. The, um, the, the sepulcher that he had hewn out of a rich man ain't going to do him any good, because he's going to be buried in the captivity. And this captivity is not only symbolically of the, of the ca captivity of Babylon, but of the captivity of the Babylon of the end times. In other words, the Kenites are building this one world order, this global system, and they think to rein in the uh, uh, reign of their father, that is to say the false Christ, and they're going to be snared in the captivity right along with the people of the world that fall to this Antichrist. These, after all, the Kenites, the scribes and Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, the so-called holy men of their time, were the ones that caused Christ's death. They denied him. They reviled him. And he told them in Matthew chapter 23 that they were responsible for all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel. Well, who slew Abel? Cain. 
to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, that fell, whom they slew between the altar and the temple. That gives you this family seed line. We're talking about the Kenites here, the sons of Cain, verse 18. He will surely violently turn and toss thee like a ball into a large country. There thou shalt die. Now this large country is of course Babylon, which would encompass uh, a great deal of land, including former Assyria and the land of Canaan, even unto Egypt, even parts of Egypt. But um, what else is this large country symbolic of? Well, it's the large country of the one world global order. In other words, the one world system. There thou shalt die, and their chariots of thy glory shall be the shame of thy Lord's, of, of thy Lord's house. In other words, all that you've done here is going to come to nothing. Verse 19. I will drive thee from thy station, that is, your office as, as the banker, as the uh, financier, uh, in, in our times, you might think of the Federal Reserve, which most people think is federal when it's privately owned. And from thy state shall he put thee down. Or, or from your estate, in other words, where, you, where you're living, which at this time was Jerusalem. Shall he put thee down? Well, who is the he that puts him down here? Well, for one, the king of Babylon. But who controls all of this? Who is sitting on the throne? God. This is what I try to impart to people as you study our Father's Word. You see, you're going to see things from the Word of God which have been hidden. You will see dual meanings in chapters in Scripture, sometimes even three or fourfold meanings if you have eyes to see and ears to hear. Because God reveals things to us. The Word speaks to us. It shows us things that you will gloss over if you try to understand this in English only. Verse 20. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, which means raised up of Yah, raised up of God, the son of Hilkiah, which means portion of Yah, or portion of God, or even servant of God. <coughs> and this refers uh, symbolically to the election, who shall rise up against this uh, false rock, this king of Babylon. But it's also symbolic of guess who? Well, who is raised up of Yah, and who is Yah's portion? His name was called Yahshua, which means God's Savior. Verse 21. And I will clothe him with thy robe. In other words, this, this treasurer wore a priest's robe. This is one of the ways you can know that he was a Kenite. This is a priest's robe. I will clothe him with a priest's robe. And strengthen him with thy girdle. And I will commit thy government into his hand. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Now, if you're a little bit unsure about this, we're going to clarify it for you here. Chapter 22, or uh, verse 22. And the key of the house of David. You know what that is? That's the key of David. I will lay upon his shoulder. So he shall open and none shall shut. And she, he shall shut, and none shall open. Now, what was written to the church of Smyrna and Philadelphia? Specifically in, in this verse, uh, to Philadelphia, in Revelation chapter 3, verse uh, about 9 to 11. They are given a key that no man can uh, shut the door and to shut and no, no man can open. Well, what is that key? It is, of course, Christ. It is the truth. It is the Word. And who is the Word? Christ. So, you've got the election here in a connotation, and you've got Christ in a connotation here. The key of David. Verse 23. 
and I will fasten him as a nail. A nail, of course, is a peg. It is something that you secure something with, that you, that you can hang on to. In a sure place, in other words, in, in a uh, place, uh, when you fasten something in a sure place, that means it's, it's not going to come loose. And he shall be for the glorious throne of his father's house. Now, I want you to also see the other type in this. We're talking here about a nail or peg fastened in a sure place, which means if you hold on to him, if you hold on to Christ, you're not going to be going anywhere. You're going to be safe. But, look at it from this point of view. Was Christ not fastened to the cross with nails in a sure place, that is to say Jerusalem, the place where God put his name? Do you see the twofold meaning in this? Verse 24. And they shall hang him upon all the glory of his father's house. And they did hang him on the cross to the glory of his father's house. In other words, through Christ's blood, we can gain remission or forgiveness for our sins. The offspring in the issue, that is to say the entire family, all vessels of small quantity and vessels of cups, even to all the vessels and of flagons. In other words, the whole family shall be blessed if they hang their hope on him. Verse 25. In that day, and we're talking about uh, the day being spoken of concerning Shebna here. Uh, in other words, we're reverting back to verse 15 concerning Shebna. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall the nail that is fastened in the sure place be removed. In other words, Shebna's nail. The, the, the Kenites. And be cut down and fall. Again, talking about Shebna. And the burden that was upon it shall be cut off, for the Lord has spoken it. But also I want you to see the next type in this. Though that is speaking of the Kenites' nail being removed, who was it that put the nails in the hands and feet of our Savior? Well, it was uh, Rome. Yeah. But who was Rome acting under the power of? Caesar? Well, uh, again, but who put pressure on Pontius Pilate, which is to say the governor of Judea, to crucify Christ? A A thing that Pilate did not even want to do and that he washed his hands of. Who was it that put those nails in his hand? In his feet? You know, our burden is removed by the blood of Christ's sacrifice when he was dead and taken down from that cross. In other words, they removed the nails to take him down and they placed him in a rich man's sepulcher. The one of Joseph of Arimathea who was a true child of Judah and not a Canaanite. And he rose from the dead and defeated death. So you have a choice here of the pegs. You can have the real peg, the real fastening nail, Christ, or you can have the peg of Shebna, which is to say the peg of the Kenites, which is untruth, denial of the truth, confusion. Which is what the Kenites have always done. They've always had power, they've always controlled commerce, and they've always had money. And this is where a lot of people... Um, give the tribe of Judah a bad name in saying that they're all money hungry and such. Uh, The tribe of Judah is one of the tribes of Israel. However, the Kenites who call themselves Jews are not of the tribe of Israel. They are more concerned with the earthly. And as you read the Gospels, you will see that every time they confronted Christ, they were concerned with the earthly. Even when he healed on the Sabbath and did a good work, they wanted to stone him. And he said, stone me for doing a good work? And they said, no, we stone thee not for a good work, but for doing it on the Sabbath. 
In other words, <laughs> they've got the Son of God standing before them there, and he heals the man right in front of them, and they want to stone him. They knew full well they couldn't heal him. They were jealous of him. Read the parable of the wicked husband. They knew who he was. Isaiah chapter 23 and verse 1. And we've got another burden here. Another oracle from God. Another utterance. And this will be against Tyre. Tyre, of course, or Tyrus, meaning rock. And what were we just talking about a minute ago? The false rock. Tyre and Sidon, or Zidon, were the stronghold of the Kenites. And if you read Ezekiel 28, you will see that uh, Satan is referred to as the king of Tyrus first and as the prince of Tyrus. In other words, before he fell, he was the king, and after he fell, he was the prince. In other words, he lost his crown. He fell in God's eyes. Uh, the burden of Tyre... How ye ships of Tarshish. Uh, Tarshish is a literal place, but this means ships of commerce. And of course, this is what the Kenites have always controlled is commerce. And Tyre and Zidon were the base or the stronghold of the Kenites. For it is laid waste. And there is no house and no entering in. In other words, no harbor. From the land of Chittim it is revealed to them. And Chittim is, of course, uh, the word means bruisers. It is symbolic of God's elect, the ships of Chittim. A number of places you will read of these ships of Chittim. And they are symbolic of God's elect, or the, the spoilers of the, the power of the Kenite and of the power of the Antichrist. Verse 2. Be still, ye inhabitants of the isle. And, of course, we're talking about the rock here, the false rock, Tyre. Thou whom the merchants of Zidon that pass over the sea have replenished. In other words, that the Kenites took over. This was once uh, a uh, portion of the children of Israel, this, this, this port. But it was taken over by the merchantmen. Verse 3. And by great waters, the seed of Sihor, um, Sihor means dark and muddy. It says a dark and muddy river. The great waters uh, have become dark and muddy. And the harvest of the river is her revenue. In other words, uh, like, like along the Nile, they grew grains and corn. Uh, anywhere near a floodplain or near a river is uh, fertile ground. So you can grow crops having to do with commerce. And she is a mart of nations. And mart means then what it meant now, as far as the English translation. In other words, a place of merchants. In other words, a place to buy things. And she is a mart of nations. What nations? The one world system. In their time, it was the mart of all the nations that we've covered. But in our time, it refers to the merchants of the one world system. And the Kenites are in control with the help of Edom, with the help of Esau, old uncle Esau, to build this one world government with socialism to bring about this one world government and to take the United States down via all the ways that I've mentioned in hundreds of times and hundreds of lectures and commentaries. It's been their plan from the beginning to do this. Verse 4. Be thou ashamed, O Zidon, for the sea has spoken, even the sea of the strength, saying, I travail not, nor bring forth children, neither do I nourish up young men, nor bring up virgins. In other words, it was stripped clean, this island. And um, we are supposed to remain or be virgins under Christ. We are not supposed to um, play the harlot. But these will play the harlot. Verse 5. As, concerning, uh, as the report concerning Egypt so shall they be sorely pained 
at the report of Tyre. In other words, uh, what was the report against Egypt? Well, that they were going to be taken into captivity. And why were they taken into captivity? For, for false god worship. And uh, since Tyre is the head of all commerce, what is this going to mean to them? Well, it's, mean that com it's going to mean that commerce is not going to flow. It's going to mean bad times financially. It's going to mean uh, not enough to go around. It's going to mean famine. And again, what is the famine of the end times? Amos chapter 8, verse 6. Pass ye over to Tarshish, howl ye inhabitants of the isle, meaning the isle of Tyre. Verse 7. Is this your joyous city, whose antiquity, that is to say origin, is of ancient days? Her own feet shall carry her afar off, and she shall be stacking away, which means destroyed. Verse 8. Who hath taken this counsel against Tyre? The crowning. Uh, the crowning city, that is to say. The crowning here, uh, who is it that makes or breaks kingdoms? Well, it's the same. It's the Kenites. Whose merchants are princes. Traffickers are the honorable of the earth. Uh... When this says honorable of the earth, this means that uh, th they're not honorable in the way as we think of honorable. It means they, they honor the earth. That They're earthly. Their honor is the honor of the earth. In other words, riches, gain, power. Verse 9. The Lord of hosts has proposed it. To stain the pride of all glory. That is, to, to, to besmirch the glory and bring contempt to all the honorable of the earth. And again, um, the earthly. The earthly are not of God. In other words, they serve the flesh more than they serve God. They serve the creature more than the creator. And this is one of the trademarks of the Kenite. Verse 10. Pass through thy land as a river, O daughter of Tarshish. There is no more strength. In other words, there's no more strength in it. Verse 11. He stretched out his hand over the sea. He shook the kingdoms. The Lord hath given a commandment against the merchant city to destroy the strongholds thereof. In other words, the Kenites. Tyre and Zidon is the stronghold of the Kenites of this time. They would always be vagabonds and fugitives and they would always change their names and always change language and uh, use um, legalese. Th this is their way. They even do that in our time. So again, you get the dual meaning here that it is prophetical to their time and it is prophetical to our time. For the Kenites are now in control in the building up of the one world government. But it's going to be brought by it to an end when the true Christ returns. <coughs> Verse 12. And he said, Thou shalt no more rejoice, O thou oppressed virgin, the daughter of Zion. Arise and pass over to Chittim. And there thou shalt also have or there also thou shalt have no rest. Verse 13. Behold the land of the Chaldeans, in other words, Babylon. This people was not till the Assyrian founded it. Who founded it? The Assyrian. Who is the Assyrian? Well, it was Sargon as the uh, historical man type. But who was the Assyrian in the spiritual type? Satan. And he founded Babylon. What does Babylon mean? Confusion. He is the founder of confusion. And Nebuchadnezzar would be the historical man type of the king of Babylon. But the king of Babylon of the end times, just as the king of Assyria, are two types given to you. A double witness so that you understand that we're referring to Satan here, the Antichrist. You know, people will base so many scriptures on the rapture by sheer English-only understanding. 
But when you look at the volume of the book, even from the Old Testament here, you see so much more that tells you there's not going to be a rapture. That there is going to be the Assyrian and the king of Babylon that come. They were even given to us in a type of Pharaoh who oppressed Israel. And they, they were set free by God. And they were set free on the night of Passover when they put the blood of the lamb on their doorposts. Well, what was the blood of that lamb symbolic of? The blood of the lamb slain, Jesus Christ. Are you listening when God is speaking to you from his word? The Assyrian founded it for, for them, they that dwell in the wilderness. They set up the towers thereof, and they raised up the palaces thereof, and he brought it to ruin. Verse 14. Howl, or, or cry out, ye ships of Tarshish, for your strength is laid waste, ye ships of commerce, the power of the Kenite. Verse 15. It shall come to pass in that day that Tyre shall even be forgotten seventy years. How long would the captivity of Babylon be? Seventy years. How long will the captivity of Babylon in our time be? Well, the book of Revelation says it will be a three and a half year period. And I still believe the three and a half year period is going to be applicable as far as the build up of it. But the power of Babylon itself when the king comes shall only be the five month period. When he comes to power with his princes, in other words his one world system rises because God has shortened the days for his elect's sake. But um, you're seeing the types here. So Tyre shall be forgotten seven years according to the days of one king. Well, what king? The king of Babylon. And after the end of seventy years shall Tyre sing as an harlot. Uh, what harlot is uh, Tyre, which is the stronghold of the Kenites, going to sing as? Mystery. Babylon, the mother of harlots from the book of Revelation. Do you think that it's any accident that this language is used in this way? I mean, there are so many key words. And that, that, you know, that, that goes right along with the key of David. There are key words here. We even use key words on the computer today, now, so that you can type a word in and find something. Or you can tag something. That's what God has done here for you. He's given you keywords so that you can recognize the type. Verse 16. Take up an harp and go about the city, thou harlot that has been forgotten, and make sweet melody and sing many songs that thou mayest be remembered. Verse 17. And it shall come to pass after the end of seventy years that the Lord will visit Tyre and shall turn to her higher and shall commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world. Now when this says the Lord shall visit her, it means visitation upon her. It doesn't mean he's going to visit her and, and use her services as a harlot. I mean, that's, that's what you could take from this if you read it in English only, but that would kind of be uh, tantamount to bl blasphemy. But he shall turn her higher, and she shall commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world. Upon the face of the earth. What does mystery Babylon, or, or who does mystery Babylon commit fornication with? Well, of course, Satan, the Antichrist. But what does she do to the kings and the people of the world? She causes them to drink the wine of her fornication. Are you getting the type? Do you have eyes to see and ears to hear? Verse 18. And her merchandise and her hire shall be holiness to the Lord. It shall not be treasured nor laid up. For her merchandise shall be for them that dwell before the Lord and eat sufficiently and for durable clothing. In other words, by what she does, it's going to correct. It's going to correct God's children. And correcting God's children is holiness to the Lord.
And to eat sufficiently, of course, means to be well fed and for durable clothing. Well, that's your uh, that's your righteous acts. That's the raiment you wear in heaven. And because of the fornication that she does, many are going to fall and worship the Antichrist. But in so doing, when the Lord returns, they're going to be corrected. In other words, they're going to be corrected while this is going on because they're going to fall and worship the Antichrist, which when the real Christ appears, when the true Christ returns, they're going to know instantly what they've done wrong. So this shall be holiness to the Lord after that respect, that his children are being corrected. And uh, as we covered a few um, lectures back concerning the king of Assyria who comes to power and he says, by my hand have I done these things and by my strength and by my chariots or whatever. And it also said, how be it he thinketh not so. In other words, he, he thinks he's doing this of his own accord. Well, he's not. He's being used as a tool in the hand of God to correct God's children. So, see the deeper spiritual connotation in this. Wake up and hear your father's word. Satan and the Kenites are here for a purpose. That's why God allowed them, and God would even bless the Kenites um, in, in one place in, uh, that we will be reading from not too long from now, where... They did the bidding of their, or the will of their father, Jehonadab. And um, they would not drink of wine, and they dwelled in tents. In other words, they followed to the letter the word of their father. They're loyal to their father. But God said, his children Israel were not loyal like that. They were a sottish and stiff-necked people. So again, the Kenites and Satan are being used to correct God's children. Isaiah chapter 24 and verse 1. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. In other words, that day is coming. Verse 2. And it shall be so as with the people, so as with the priest, so as with the servant, so as with his master, so as with his maid, so as with her mistress, so as with the buyer, so as with the seller, so as with the lender, so as with the borrower, so as with the taker of usury, so as with the giver of usury unto him. In other words, everybody. Verse 3. And the land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled, for the Lord hath spoken this word. And of course, you've got the twofold meaning here of the people shall be taken away captive, and um, in, in this Babylonian captivity, only a few would be left behind in uh, Jerusalem because they were too poor and uh, probably too weak, too famished, too skinny, not able to do work, not able to serve the king of Babylon. So they were left there to be vine dressers. But this concerns everybody when it says this, in the prophetical sense, when Christ returns, the earth shall be emptied of people. There shall be no more sea, and the sea in the book of Revelation is symbolic of the people. In other words, the flesh age is over with at that time. And the Lord has spoken this word. Verse 4. The earth mourneth and fadeth away. The world languisheth and fadeth away. The haughty people of the earth do languish. In other words, the haughty are the, uh, the the uppity, those that are raised up in self-pride or because of their possessions. Verse 5. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws and changed the ordinance and broken the everlasting covenant. In other words, they have not paid attention to God's word. They have transgressed his laws. Well, how have they done that? Well, think about it. Abortion, legal, homosexual, uh, homosexuality and lesbianism out of the closet and called common. Man being taught that he evolved from apes. 
uh, teaching children sexuality before the age that they ought to know about it? I mean, we even see the results of it now in the diseases which are up upon the earth because of these lifestyles. And they've changed the ordinances. In other words, they've changed God's laws. Not only have they transgressed them, they've changed them. We don't put murderers to death anymore. If we do, it takes between 12 and 25 years. So people yell and say, see there? It's not a deterrent. Of course it's not a deterrent if it takes 25 years to do it. And that's because of crooked lawyers making appeal after appeal after appeal after appeal. It's, it's just like this gay marriage thing that's going on now. It has been struck down so many times in the Supreme Court, yet they do not try, stop trying. And they're not going to stop trying until they get it passed. There is one thing to be said for the Kenites is that they are tenacious. They do not give up. They are a well-oiled and organized machine as God promised they would be. And they have broken the everlasting covenant. In other words, the, the agreement God made with his children. Many people don't even know what those agreements or that covenant is. The true covenant now, the new covenant, is Jesus Christ. And many people don't even believe in him. Verse 6. Therefore the Lord hath cursed, or, or therefore hath the cursed devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. In other words, the cursings that God said was going to come to pass has devoured the earth, and they that dwell in are desolate. What does it mean to be desolate? Well, read Daniel chapter 8 and chapter 9. The abomination of desolation. They're made desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned and few men left. In other words, burned here is not necessarily uh, applicable to uh, burned with fire. It has that connotation. Uh, it, it means scorched. In, in in a sense, uh, burnt with deception, and there are few men left who are not deceived. And of course, the elect are few. Verse 7. The new wine mourneth, and the vine languisheth. All the merry-hearted do sigh. What is the new wine? Remember what Jesus Christ said about new wine being placed into old bottles? And the vine languisheth. What is the vine? Who is our true vine? It's not that he languishes. It's that the truth of the vine languishes. Well, why would that be? Well, look at how many denominations there are in Christianity. And look at how much of Christianity believes in lies. Again, such as the rapture of the church. Hey, don't worry about it. You don't need to read the Bible. All you've got to do is have faith. John 3.16 and you're going to be saved and you're going to fly away before any of this even happens. Of course, that is the biggest lie ever told in, crea in Christianity. But it's also one of the biggest teachings in Christianity. Verse 8. The mirth of tabrets ceaseth. The noise of them that rejoice endeth. The joy of the harp seetheth. In other words, there's not going to be any happy songs anymore. All the happiness and mirth and joy are gone. Verse 9. For they drink not wine with a song. Strong drink, strong drink shall be bitter to them that drink it. And again, you've got the choice here. They do not drink wine with the song. In other words, the true wine... But they drink strong drink, and it's bitter to them. Again, what is the wine of fornication that Mystery Harblet Babylon deals out to the world? Verse 10. The city of confusion is broken down. What have I told you a number of times that the word Babylon means? It means confusion. Remember what it says in Revelation? Babylon has fallen, has fallen. That great city? The city of Babylon is broken down. The city of confusion is broken down. 
Every house is shut up that no man may come in. Verse 11. There is a crying for wine in the streets. Uh, In other words, a crying for the true wine. All joy is darkened and the mirth of the land is gone. Verse 12. In the city is left desolation. In the gate is smitten of with destruction. You got two of Satan's names right there. The desolator and the destruction. Apollyon and Abaddon mean the destroyer, which is linked to this word destruction. To destroy is to destruct. And the abomination of desolation, again, Daniel chapter 8 and chapter 9. Which causes this wine to cease and why people are crying for the wine. Verse 13. When thus it shall be said in the midst of the land among the people, there, w- there shall be as a shaking as an olive tree, as the gleaning of grapes when the vintage is done. In other words, when you shake an olive tree, all the olives fall off of it, and when you glean the grapes, all the grapes fall to the ground on the uh, parchments or whatever they put up under it to catch them. Verse 14. They shall lift up their voice, and they shall sing for the majesty of the Lord, and shall cry aloud from the sea. Again, what is the sea of the people of the book of Revelation? Verse 15. Wherefore glorify ye the Lord in the fires, even the name of the Lord God of Israel in the isles of the sea. And the isles of the sea could be uh, symbolic of the continents. Verse 16. From the uttermost part of earth have we heard songs, even glory unto the righteous. But I said, my leanness, my leanness. In other words, I'm thin, I'm famished. Woe unto me. The treacherous dealers have dealt treacherously. Yea, the treacherous dealers have dealt very treacherously. Who are the treacherous dealers? Well, you could say the the Kenites mixed with the Edomites, but you could also say this of the pulpits of many churches. They have dealt treacherously by teaching false teachings, which is again why people cry out for the wine. They want the true fruit of the vine, which is symbolic of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and His blood shed. That's why we take communion every year at Passover with unleavened bread and with the wine. The bread being symbolic of His body which is unleavened. In other words, it hasn't got any leaven of the scribes and Pharisees in it because it's all truth. And the wine, which is symbolic of his blood shed. And when we partake of that, we are saved. Verse 17. (coughs) Fear and the pit and the snare are upon thee, O inhabitants of the earth. This is talking about during the reign of the Antichrist. Verse 18, And it shall come to pass that he who fleeth from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit, and he that cometh up out of the pit shall be taken of the snare. For the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth do shake. Um, You know, I've often made the comparison of atheism and secularism which are so prevalent in our society now, that they're going to be a double whammy to people. Because the people that are atheists now and are pushing secularism in our schools and everywhere else, quite frankly, and trying to remove God from us and separation of church and state and perverting God's laws, as we read earlier, and transgressing the laws and changing the ordinances, um, they're going to... um, they're going to fall and worship this Antichrist when he comes, thinking he's Christ. And they're going to say, oh, Jesus, forgive us. We didn't know. We, we, we thought atheism was the way because science, secular science, made more sense to us. It made more sense to us that we evolved from apes because we've got bones and we're made of flesh and we've got hair like an ape, so we thought we must be an ape. Can, can you forgive us? And, of course, Satan, playing the role of Antichrist, is going to say, My children, come unto me. Come unto me, my children, for soon we shall fly away. And everything shall be just fine. You are my children, and I care very deeply for you. 
He's going to say everything that you would expect Christ to say if you were taken. But you see, that's what you've got here with the fear and they that fall into the pit. First, they're going to fall into the pit, and when they come out of the pit, in other words, when it's revealed who the Antichrist is, and they try to climb up out of the pit of worshiping him, they're going to be taken in the snare that they had worshipped him. So it's going to be a double whammy for them. In other words, they're going to convert from atheism to Christianity. Only the Christianity they convert to is false Christianity. In other words, the worship of the false Christ. So that when the true Christ comes, guess what? They're going to have another surprise. This is why we study from our Father's Word to show ourselves approved and to gird up the gospel armor of our Lord so we can stand against the fiery darts of Satan and not believe in fairy tales such as the rapture. Verse 19. The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. You know, God destroyed the earth age that was. You can read of it in Jeremiah chapter 4 and 2 Peter chapter 3 and uh, in um, Isaiah 58 when we come to it, it's written that the earth was not created void and out without form, which is why in Genesis God told man to go forward, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Not plenish it, but to replenish it. So, what you've got here is, this has happened once before when Satan tried to overthrow God, and it's going to happen again. Because God is not going to allow Satan to keep deceiving his children. He's going to give him a short time, five months, the time of the locust written in the book of Revelation, where they have the power to hurt men, which is to say deceive them, as a scorpion. And I've already explained that in a number of analogies. It simply means to turn you to mush as the scorpion takes his prey. Verse 20. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be removed like a cottage. And the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and shall not rise again. In other words, not this flesh age. The earth itself is not going to be destroyed. God has promised that. The earth was made to be inhabited. And God is going to create a new earth and a new heaven age, as promised at the end of the book of Revelation. Verse 21. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the hosts of the high ones that are on high, and the kings of the earth upon the earth. Well, who is the host of the high ones that are on high? Well, who, who's the king over them? Satan Antichrist. And it's written in the book of Jude that 7,000 of his fallen angels, Nephilim, Nephilim, are going to be killed instantly at the return of Christ. 7,000 of them. I know it says men, but we've already covered that man, in some cases in the Bible, simply means males. And there, there has never been seen a female angel. Now, I know some of certain denominations believe so, but even so, uh, we go by what the Bible says. And every angel that has ever been seen, every messenger that has ever been seen has always been a young man. So, the host of the high ones that are on high, in other words, those fallen angels and Satan, and the kings of the earth, in other words, the ones that mystery harlot uh, committed fornication with, and some of these are those ten kings mentioned in the book of Revelation, are going to be brought down. The Lord shall punish them, verse 22. And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit, and shut up in the prison, and after many days they shall be visited. Uh, judged would be a more appropriate word, verse 23. When the moon shall be confounded, and the sun ashamed, the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, uh, and before his ancients glor uh, gloriously. And uh, th there's a lot in this sentence. The moon shall be confounded. It means it's not going to give forth its light. The sun shall be ashamed. In other words, the, the sun is not a living being, so it can't be ashamed. What does this mean? It means the brightness of Christ is going to overshadow the sun and the moon so that they do not even show. He shall be the brightness thereof. 
And the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and before his ancients. Who are his ancients? Well, all of his children who have overcome. In other words, our souls are vastly older than we know. Even to the first earth age. And a lot of people really don't grasp that concept, nor do they understand it. Um, our souls are perhaps um, millions or even billions of years old when it comes right down to it. Well, I've never heard anything like that before. Well, how do you suppose that people are predestined in the Bible? How did hate God uh, hate Esau and love Jacob before they were ever born? How did God say unto Jeremiah, I knew thee before thou was in thy mother's womb. I chose thee before the foundations of the world. Do you know what the foundation is? It's the first thing laid down. God knew us before the foundations of the world. Well, how could he know us? Now, a, a lot of people in Christian mysticism are saying, well, well because God's all-knowing. But the trouble with their logic is this. If God is completely all-knowing, then why has he made this earth age to give man a chance? In other words, if God already knows the outcome of every single person's soul, who's going to make it, and who is it, who's going to burn in hell, and who's going to make salvation, then why is he bothering to do all this? It is because God does not know that. I'm not saying he doesn't have a very extremely good idea of it. But he does not know if a soul will have a change of heart and will generate love from within and come to him. That is why God gave us free will. If God had wanted a bunch of little robots running around here saying, I love you, Father. I love you, God. Praise God. We love you, Father then he would have made us that way. But he didn't make us that way. He gave free will unto man to make the choice. And a lot of people, upon hearing this stuff that I'm saying, will probably say, well, it sounds like you're talking blasphemy to me and saying God isn't all-knowing. Well, I'm not saying God isn't all-knowing. It's just that he's not all-knowing to the limits or to the, uh, to the uh, heights that man pushes him credit to. Because even God himself does not know which souls might turn and come to him and which ones might not. Which is why even a Kenite, a son of Cain, can come to the Lord. It is written that God is long-suffering towards usward, or to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And he's giving us every chance to come to that re repentance, which is why he's going to have the day of the Lord, which is to say the thousand-year period when Christ and his apostles and his elect reign called the millennium. That will be the time of teaching and discipline. And many souls will be converted at that time. Well, I've never heard of such a thing. Uh, if you don't make it in this earth age, I, I, I always heard that you didn't make it. Well, really. Did you ever read the portion where when Christ cru was crucified, he ascended or uh, descended into the pit for three days and brought some of the prisoners out all the way back to the time of Noe, which is to say Noah, which really means all the way back to the beginning? He freed them because he went and preached to them. And brought them across, out of darkness, into the light, so to speak. This is what the parable of Lazarus and the, or Lazarus and the rich man was about. He wanted a drink of water on his tongue. He wanted the living water on his tongue. It's not that he was thirsty from being in hell because he was hot from burning. It was because he wanted a drop of the truth upon his tongue. And in the millennium, the drops of truth are going to be dispensed liberally. And people will turn and come to the Lord. That is how much our Father cares for us. We, even in the human flesh, if we're lucky enough to have children and be a father or mother or whatever, 
Our feelings are a template of God's feelings, and even we, with the love of children, cannot even fathom nor grasp the love that our Father has for us. I mean, imagine the Lord God of hosts, the creator of all things, taking himself and making himself a little lower than the angels and putting himself into a flesh body, Emmanuel, God with us, God dwelling with man. As Christ would say in John 10.30, if you have seen the Son, you have seen the Father. And as he would speak to Philip, Knowest ye not the Father? You asked to see the Father? When the, when the Father is standing before you? In other words, Christ is God incarnate, or was God incarnate. He was God in the flesh, God dwelling, tabernacling with man in the flesh. He came down here and put himself into this nasty, carnal flesh. Which is nasty, because it stinks, it pollutes, it aches, it hurts, it has imperfections, warts, and um, moles, and, and birthmarks, and hair sticking out of places that they shouldn't be. You know, I'm not trying to embarrass anybody here, I'm just saying. The flesh is a very carnal thing. And that's why those that turn to the flesh rather than to the spiritual uh, are lost as far as this earth age. You know, that's why Paul took the time to explain to us that we have two bodies, the celestial and the terrestrial. In other words, this corruptible must put on incorruption. Well, how do you do that? By coming to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. At any rate, I hope I've gotten my point clear here. Uh, I had hoped to get a little bit farther in this book than I made it, but that's okay. We'll pick it up in the next lecture and we'll go with it from there. But as always, my brothers and sisters in Christ, it is my prayer for you that you will study your Father's Word in depth and go into these words and not just take my word for it because I say a thing. I'm a human being. I could be wrong. Check me out. Go into the Greek and Hebrew, learn the manners of speech, and study and please your Father by showing Him you love Him enough to study His Word. And may our Father bless you, those of you who care enough to study His Word, and give you that hidden knowledge, that hidden wisdom, and reveal to you through type and example and literal and prophecy His words and His overall plan so that you will not walk in darkness, but you will walk in light because you are studied in the volume of the book. God bless you and thank you for listening. This has been Just Thoughts.